It is my great pride and pleasure to welcome Alenti into the AppNexus family. And I'd like to introduce to you Laurent and Nico, the founders of Alenti. You're not a true Apnexian until you have your first Apnexus backpack. <laughs> so it's my great honor to present to you the <laughs> Apnexus backpack. Now I'd also like, we also are, are fortunate to welcome here today our newest Apnexians. Will the uh, former Alenti employees please stand up? I want to congratulate all of you and thank you for the incredible work you've done over the past seven years to bring viewability to something that we can all use in reality. Oh, and by the way, for all of you, your backpacks are outside. I couldn't hold you know, 18 backpacks. So go find Mark Dickstein. He'll give them to you. They're, they're backstage. They're out there. Um, and you can walk around proudly as Apnexians. Um, now, the people at Apnexus who've made this deal possible, I'd like to welcome to stage two. So Gare Magnuson, our CTO. Gare, thank you. And David Blanick, our French country manager. Right. These guys are going to talk to you about the future of viewability. Take it Thanks away. So, please, guys. So, uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be moderating this panel where we learn uh, a bit more about how Alan T and AppNexus will write a new story together and learn more about viewability. But before I do that, I wanted to share a story with you. So, since we're in Europe, I thought we'd be using a little bit of European history. So my history takes place 200 years ago in Paris, in the Paris Stock Exchange. So the Paris Stock Exchange was actually created in 1724, and you could trade there foreign currencies, stocks, and foreign exchanges. So during 50 years, the, the Paris Stock Exchange were running well, and in the 70s, so 1770, people would look at how to make it a better exchange, a better marketplace. So they, they actually realized that the most traded asset on the market was foreign currencies. They would think, well, it's really natural because you have all those merchants coming from all over Europe in Paris to trade currencies so that they can buy and sell stuff in their own country. But actually what they realized is that people were trading a lot because the brokers were extremely low. So they would be screaming the, the prices of what they would be willing to buy the currency. So since they would be screaming the prices because they want everybody to understand what they are saying because it was foreign language for them, a little bit like what I'm doing right now, so they wanted to make sure to be understood by the people. So because they were extremely low and they were screaming the prices, everybody around was aware of the prices. So it was very transparent for, actual, for foreign currencies. So in 1774, the king Louis XV, because in any good old French story, you need a king somewhere, right? So in 1774, the King Louis XV make it completely obligatory for all the brokers to scream as loud as possible the price they were bidding. Can you imagine like the mess? So at the end of the first day where this was obligatory, first the first consequence is that the brokers will have like pain on the throat and in their ears because they were screaming to each other. But the second consequence is actually the volume completely exploded in the Paris Stock Exchange. And actually, this set a standard for the centuries to come because in, until the 1980, so in the 80s, people were still screaming the stock prices and it's only being disrupted uh, by electronic trading. So this short story really tells you how a little innovation in the market that actually make the market more transparent, more quality, actually increase liquidity. And this is exactly what we're going to do with viability. So with no further ado, I'm excited to have the panel with the inventor of that tech screaming, Laurent and Nico, <laughs> and King Gear the First, <laughs> the city of Nexus. I'm actually a bit disappointed that you didn't brought, bring your crown. Uh, your crown. It, was, it was confiscated in immigration on the way. Okay. <laughs> Especially we have King's Place. So. Yeah. so guys, super excited to have you here. 
Uh, my first question to you is that uh, you built LNT seven years ago, so you founded the company seven years ago. Seven years ago, nobody knew really about viewability. So how did you at that time identify the problem and how did you see this emerging as a hot topic in the industry? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, it's, you have to go much further away because uh, Nico and I, we've been working in the, uh, ad, in the analytics industry for more than 15 years. And uh, back in 99, uh, the first client that uh, we had at uh, a company called NetValue that was doing audience measurement, uh, they saw the first audience measurement of websites uh, in France. And they told me, okay, it's nice, but what if an ad is on the page, but nobody can see it? And I said, okay, uh, there is no technology to measure, to measure if ads are viewable uh, in, in 99, so let's stay at the page level at this moment. Seven years later, with Nico, we did a lot of R&D to see how far we could bring the new technologies of Ajax, uh, JavaScript, etc. And at one moment, we, uh, we set up a, a template page, a page for a test, and I told Nico, okay, what if you put an ad in there? Can we measure if the ad is actually uh, viewable? And I remembered that it was a, a long need um, for, for the market. But in 99, the technologies were not ready. In 2007, they were ready. So we actually started at that moment in this direction. Very interesting. And how do you see the clients involving with viewability and uh, the topic really emerging as a hot topic for them? Well, it, it started uh, on both sides, on the buy side and the sell side. And that's why, uh, why it's really interesting. Uh, at the very beginning, 90, uh, in, in 2008, we had uh, both uh, sides of the equation uh, clients who wanted on one side to, uh, to lower the prices using viewability or to, do, uh, to bargain, but on the other side we had publishers who wanted to, uh, to improve the prices using viewability. And both were uh, started uh, exactly the same way. So we, uh, you may not know, but we have a client, uh, Canal Press in France, who's been uh, selling viewable impressions only uh, uh, for five years now. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see that even the, on the sales side, uh, adding uh, uh, a guarantee for viewable impression uh, is a way to remove bad, uh, bad inventory and to, uh, to, to have a um, uh, competitive advantage and to increase the prices, and it actually works. Great. So, Gare, actually, I'd like to have the looking glass perspective on, uh, on this. Um, so you're the city of AppNexus, you're looking after uh, everything in the infrastructure, the bidding system, the algorithm, the data pipeline, everything. So how actually viewability beca became on top of your pie? It's a good question. We, um, we, we, we smiled because Looking Glass was the, uh, the project code name internally while we were doing the acquisition. Um, th there is a lot on our plate, right? But uh, viewability is really a, a, an important subject now in our industry. If you step back a little bit and, and look at the industry as a whole, um, for example, the MRC recently lifted its advisory on, uh, on using viewability technology in the buying process. Uh, I was at the IAB Leadership Summit last year, and it, it was a topic that, that seemed to come up in, in almost every session in some way, shape, or form. Um, if you look at our customers, uh, the biggest buyers on our platform are requiring that viewability technology as part of their buying process. Um, let's, let's take a quick poll. For, for those of you in the room that are, are buyers first, um, how many of you care that your ad impressions are, your ads are, are seen by human beings? <laughs> that few. Um, for those of you that do, how many of you are using viewability technology today of some sort? Okay, so quite a number. And for those of you that aren't uh, using it today, how many will be in the next six to 12 months? Everybody, please. <laughs> um, so, so it's important, right? It, it was something that, you know, with everything we have to do, it came to the top of the stack. And, um, you know, and finally, we think that with such an important topic and given the sort of the breadth and depth of the AppNexus platform, we felt that by combining viewability with the existing platform, we were able to uh, do something that nobody else so far has been able to do. So then why did you select those guys, choose those guys to make this improvement in the platform? Well, you know, look, we're a technology company, and we build a lot of difficult technology. Um, we're not afraid to do it, um, but we also know where our limits are. So as we started down this process, we looked at, uh, at building uh, ourselves, uh, partnering with somebody or buying, uh, and came to the conclusion that 
the fastest way to get this technology in the hands of our customers was to, to look at an acquisition. Uh, we looked at many, many companies. Um, and a, a Lenti stood out to us for a bunch of reasons. First, um, they, at the time, and certainly I think still today, are the highest rated uh, viewability uh, technology on the market that's available to you. Uh, and that's important to us. We need to know that it works. Um, second, the technology uh, is very much aligned with ours, and we felt that uh, it would be very um, sort of straightforward, at least in the beginning, to integrate their technology to, to get into the hands of our customers as soon as possible. Uh, and finally, we looked at the team. Um, this is a company that has, for the last seven years, been focused on this. Uh, it's not a feature in their portfolio. It is what they do. Uh, and the result is you have an engineering team and a, and a business team that uh, are, are real thought leaders and experts in the space. So we felt that you know, with those three factors, they would be a, a great addition to the, to the AppNexus family, if you will. Great. So, Nico, you are the uh, technology prodigy behind uh, LNT. Uh, you uh, achieved to build a technology that can measure 98% of the ad impression. You're the only one that can do that in the market. So what, was the, what were the main challenges in building the technology? Good question. Um, <clears throat> just think that uh, we start, we are working in the browser, okay, and we have to calculate, or we should say we have to guess to how to have some visibility information from uh, properties that are not related to the visibility. So we have to, to think and to work differently. Um, and also, we have to achieve that to be possible in all the context of all the different websites, all the different uh, technologies that are involved in a website that are in the advertising pipe. So we have to mix all together, uh, make it true works in the same way for every brother, every operating system. Great. So, and what were the technical details that actually made you completely ahead of your competitor? Um, Laurent partially answered that, that it's, um, we, we start seven years ago, so we grow with some new brother, we grow with the mobile, just think about that uh, 70 years ago, uh, there was no mobile, it was not something for you, and um, as Gear also answered is that uh, we are focused, we were focused only on the visibility, okay, so we have, we have very high expertise on that, we know we can do that, only that, but on very well. So, Laurent, I'd like to talk uh, with you a little bit more about the impact now for the industry. So you've uh, recently published a report that said that only half of the ads are seen mm -hmm. uh, over the internet. Uh, I also have a, a quote from uh, Rob Norman, the chief Digi digital officer of Group M, and we have a bunch of Group M people in the room, that say we only are going to pay for ads if they are seen. So how do you see the repercussion of making a standard viewability in programmatic? for buyers and sellers, how should everybody in the room should be prepared to that? Yes, the, uh, the impact of viewability on programmatic, uh, as I said uh, in the past uh, history of uh, LNT, uh, it will uh, work on, on both sides. It has to work on both sides. And um, so, as I said, uh, having viewable impressions only on the buy side is, uh, is really important because uh, you, you really want to touch people, and uh, as Gia uh, asked the question, uh, everybody is interested in reaching uh, human beings who uh, can be influenced by the advertising, otherwise uh, it's uh, money wasted. Uh, so on the, on the buy side, it's, it's obvious, and the fact to have uh, viewability directly included in a buying platform uh, will uh, make a, a great change because automatically uh, the bids, uh, uh, the, uh, the purchase will be adapted to the level of viewability uh, and the, uh, the performance indicators uh, of the advertiser. But on the other side, uh, the, the publishers today, they have to face a worldwide competition with a lot of uh, websites of uh, low quality who, who can generate uh, tons of, uh, uh, of impressions. Uh, and this, um, the, the, pub, the, the publishers who have real content and a real uh, business model on, on advertising, they need to uh, show their strengths. And their strengths uh, is to have viewable ads with human beings uh, actually uh, seeing uh, the ads. So for, for them, it will also uh, help uh, clean the market 
and it will reduce the bad inventory and if you have uh, less um, buyable inventory, then uh, the, uh, the prices for the good inventory uh, will, uh, will be higher. So the, the overall equation is to clean everything and to uh, have uh, more money put where uh, efficiency is. Right, perfect. So um, I'd like to finish with a last question for you two. So as an entrepreneur, you made it. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and you don't have that many exits uh, in Europe of uh, ad tech company or tech company in general that are being bought by American companies. So it's not like Silicon Valley or Tel Aviv where that happens uh, all the time. So how do you see that evolving in the European startup and tech scene? I think that we are only at the beginning of a, a, a very deep change. Uh, when I look at, uh, at France or uh, Europe in general, I see a lot of, uh, of new startups uh, growing. And even if uh, Europe in general has uh, less, uh, it's more difficult to, to get funding uh, than in some other countries, at the same time, uh, the market itself has evolved and uh, platforms like AppNexus, uh, the fact that they are open, it reduces a barrier to entry to, uh, to add uh, features and uh, to, uh, to innovate uh, in this ecosystem. And uh, that's why a company like LNT with uh, very little funding uh, could succeed, it because the barrier to entry is lower now than, uh, than, uh, than ever. So it means uh, that the, all the startups that you that are that I see every day in uh, uh, in France and in Europe, uh, they will uh, they will grow, and uh, I think uh, that Europe is back in the race. Oh, and Gear, why have you been crazy enough to buy a French company in an office <laughs> in Paris and the engineering team in Quimper, a city that not even the French people could you know see where it is in the map? Survey, <laughs> please. <laughs> right. <laughs> you guys are French. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, we, we joke about this. The reason was, is, you know, for the food. Um, <laughs> and then the, the wine, the, the cheese. Um, <laughs> if you don't know where Kemper is, it, it, you go to Paris and you go west until you get wet. And then you come back a few feet and then you're there. Um, you know, when we were doing the, the deal, uh, depending on the day you travel, you can get to Beijing faster than Kemper from New York. <laughs> Um, we're a distributed global company, right? We have an engineering teams um, in, we have an engineer in Paris already. We have engineers in London, New York, Portland, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, San Francisco. Um, we, we've done this for a while, so having a, another engineering team somewhere else is, is really just fine. It, it's, the key for us was that, you know, Alenti was the right decision for us. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a great addition to the AppNexus family, and um, we're really excited to get the technologies integrated as fast as possible. Perfect. So thank you very much, Guy. Again, congratulations, and, I, I and welcome to, to the AppNexus family. Thank you.